please welcome Dr. Gemma Munro. Thank you. Hello. So we have an hour together today. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I was with a group of founders in the audience listening to a successful VC talk. And uh, I won't tell you his name. He was 60-ish, uh, jeans, puffy vest. And he turned to us just before he started. And he said with great sincerity, not great emotion, but great sincerity, I promise you, this will be the best 45 minutes of your life. And I took the opportunity to look at the audience. And I, I swear I could see their thoughts on their faces, which was, oh, it might be overreaching just a little bit. I've had some good 45 minutes in my life. So I'm not going to overreach today in my promise, but I am going to make a promise to you, which is that I promise that you'll leave this session with some practical tips that you can use to increase your confidence, increase your effectiveness, increase your success in the workplace. And for the people leaders and the emerging or aspiring people leaders, I also promise I'm going to share some tips with you on how to create successful and effective female leaders. So before we dive into the content, I want to answer that question that your brain has, which is, eh, why am I listening to this chick from Australia? I've got a gazillion things to do on my list. I could be just crossing them off right now. So a little bit about me, uh, Ian has given you some of the detail. Uh, but I want to give you my story in a nutshell, very, very briefly. I started Inkling Women five years ago, uh, at a time in my life where most people said I was nuts to start a business. So I had two children under three, uh, two mortgages. I had a husband who ran his own climate change consultancy and therefore didn't have a regular salary coming in. And most people thought I was crazy. But it was like I couldn't not start Inkling Women because I kept having these conversations. I was in a very serious management consulting career. And I kept having these conversations with women who were starting their career or midway through their career. And they were saying to me, Jem, I see the women at the top of my organization. And yes, I see success. But do I see balance? Do I see enjoyment? Do I see authenticity? I don't. So I don't see a path for myself to become a leader where I'm happy, where I have a balanced life. And I'm going to opt out of leadership altogether. At the same time, unbeknownst to them, I was having conversations with their female leaders. And those conversations went more like, Jem, yes, I'm, I'm achieving results, I've got success, but I'm exhausted. And I feel like I have to push myself out of bed every morning. And somewhere along the way, I have lost a sense of who I am and why I'm driving myself this hard, the purpose behind what I'm doing. And I thought, surely, because my, my belief is that the world's going to be a much better place when 50% of the world's most important decisions are made by women. Surely there needs to be a way where women can step into senior level uh, roles, unlock the benefits of gender diversity for the organization, which are tremendous, and absolutely thrive. So five years later, Inkling Women is working with really large enterprise to rapidly lift the percentage of women at leadership level. And I've uh, coached and worked with over 10,000 women around the world and also work with hundreds of leadership teams. And so today I'm here to share my tips with you. I do want to ask us to commit to two non-negotiable guidelines today. I hope that's okay with you. So guideline number one, I ask that you lean into discomfort. There might be some tips I share with you or some things you consider today that you think, ooh, I don't know, I might just take a step back on that. And you've got a choice. You can step back from it or you can lean into it. I ask that you lean into it because would you agree it's only through leaning into discomfort that we grow and we actually like to grow. But if we look back on the biggest periods of growth in our life, it has come through being incredibly uncomfortable. I have worked with enough cynical <laughs> executives to know my hypothesis is that they have stayed way, they've stayed in their comfort zone for way too long. Because what happens is when we don't lean into discomfort, there's actually no such thing as stasis. There's no such thing as staying the same. So we suddenly get a little bit bored, listless, apathetic, then we get cynical, negative, and then we become grumpy old bastards. And no one likes working with grumpy old bastards. So I ask that you lean into discomfort today. The other non-negotiable guideline 
is uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. In other words, when we have conversations together as a group, uh, and I mean more in small groups, I want you to keep those between yourselves. It doesn't mean that you can't go after the session and say, hey, I learnt this great tip on dot, 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 but what I don't want is you'll never guess what happened to Susan from accounting. We don't want those kinds of conversations. Everyone happy to commit to those two non-negotiable guidelines? Yes? Is that a yes? Okay, excellent. Okay. Who here has heard of the amygdala? Yep. Anyone heard of the amygdala uh, referred to as the lizard brain? Some of you? Yeah. So for those of you that haven't heard much about the amygdala or the lizard brain, it's a tinsy tiny part of your brain. And thousands of years ago, it played this incredibly important function, which was to keep you safe from predators and also to constantly be looking out for lack of food. So the message it gave you thousands of years ago was stay small, stay hidden, stay small, stay hidden, stay small, stay hidden. Fast forward to where we're at now. Anyone here in this room at least worried about not having enough dinner t uh, on the table tonight? No? Anyone worried about having too much dinner? on the table tonight. We're so lucky. If you're in this room, you're lucky enough to not have to worry about enough dinner. You're lucky enough, I assume, you're not thinking about going home and being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. You're lucky enough to not have to worry about attack from predators. But the lizard brain, thousands of years ago, evolved to stay busy, constantly switched on. And bless its cotton socks, it needed to do that because if it switched off for one minute, you'd get eaten, correct? Or you'd die of starvation. Again, fast forward now, because the lizard brain is constantly switched on and cannot think thoughts like, <gasps> so could you tiger over there? It makes stuff up. It makes up negative thoughts to keep you safe and small and hidden. So instead of thinking, <gasps> saber tooth tiger, it, it actually doesn't know the difference between saber tooth tiger and slightly confronting work situation. And it will feed you thoughts like, you are going to look like an idiot. You're going to step up there and you're going to make a complete fool of yourself and no one will listen to your opinion ever, ever again. And have you got any chance of getting a promotion in this place? No, you've totally blown that. It does that, again, bless that it's doing its job, to keep you safe and small and hidden. It's just that approximately 99% of those negative thoughts are untrue. They are complete lies. A couple of examples for you. We run a, a public speaking program for women, and this always sounds really weird when I, I tell you what the exercise is, but it does make sense in the, in the sense of the two days, in the context of the two days. We ask women to stand up in front of the group and tell the group what their lizard is saying to them. So share those negative thoughts with the group. We create a very safe space before we ask them to do this, of course. Uh, and we had one woman stand up in Melbourne, and she said, my Liz is telling me I shouldn't have worn these boots. These boots are ridiculous looking. Everyone's judging me for these boots. And I kid you not, 20 women stood up behind her and said, we love your boots. We've been looking at your boots since you got here. We've been coveting those boots. The very next person to step up said, hey, my lizard voice is saying that I have no presence and I'm so boring and why would anyone look at me? And I kid you not, this woman had the most natural presence I have seen in a speaker for years. Have you ever seen anyone where you can't stop looking at them? Because it's like they've got electricity sparking off all over them. She had that. And yet her lizard was telling her otherwise. Uh, I, had, I actually was able to watch my lizard voice in action uh, a year or two ago. And I have to say, this story makes me sound way cooler than I actually Am. I am a choir nerd from way back. I was one of those, uh, this one time, at band camp, kids at school that got teased for being a music nerd. That was me. Uh, but a little while ago, I was able to sing live on stage with the Rolling Stones. I was a backing singer for You Can't Always Get What You Want, which is a very cool story, right? Just, just very clear, I'm not that cool. It just happened to happen to me. Uh, but I watched my lizard voice in action. I was walking up the ramp. It was this huge stadium, 53,000 people walking up the ramp, and my lizard was saying, okay, find, find a piece of grass and dig it, and then get under the piece of grass and hide, and no one will be able to find you. Managed to get through that, put my earpiece in, went backstage, they were singing brown sugar, and the next thought went through my head was, you are going to walk on stage, 
Uh, but before you get to the spotlight, you are going to trip over and 53,000 people will laugh at you. And then you'll manage to get up and you'll stand in front of the mic and you will pee your pants. This was honestly the thought. You will pee your pants and there'll be a puddle of pee all around me. Uh, and then even you, you'll keep going and you'll sing the first note and it'll be a bum note. And Mick will look at you and you'll go like that. And there will be a big screen with Mick going, what did that singer just do? And everyone will forever know you as the singer who completely fluffed up the Rolling Stones concert. So this is what our lizard voice does. It feeds us lies to keep us safe and small and hidden. And over the years of coaching multiple people, I've worked out that the lizard has three main lies it tells you. And if you think about all the negative self-talk, because most people have this negative self-talk. Can I just check in? Are you guys like, no? We work at Google, we've got no negative self talk. <laughs> no? You, you, you're understanding what I'm saying? Can I just get some nods so I know? Okay, good. Uh, most people, when you think of that negative self talk, you'll be able to fit it into one of three categories. Okay? <coughs> Category number one I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not qualified enough, I'm not experienced enough, I'm not old enough, I'm not young enough, etc, etc, etc. Firstborns tend to fit firmly in this category. I own this puppy, like I own this category. And what happens if you're in this category is you will reach something, you reach a goal and you go, okay, right, fine, I'm still not good enough, what's next? And then you keep going, still not good enough, right, what's next? And people in this category never feel that they are good enough. They've always got to keep striving. Okay, so that's category number one, I'm not good enough. Category number two, I'm not worthy. I'm not deserving of dot, dot, dot. My husband is a very open person, so I have cleared it with him to tell you this story. But I remember, he, he fits firmly in this camp. I remember when uh, we had first got together uh, about... 16 years ago, uh, and you can tell it's a long time because there's no way we would have time to do this activity right now, but for his birthday, I set him a treasure hunt. You know, two young kids, as if I could set a treasure hunt now. Anyway, um, so he was walking through the house and getting clues and opening a present, getting clues and opening a present, etc. It went on and on and on. We were university students. Uh, and he, about halfway through the treasure hunt, he visibly melted. I said, honey, what's wrong? He said, oh, I just, I don't feel like I deserve all this love and all this attention. So Ben, my husband, category two, which is I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving of. Category number three is I have nothing of value to offer. So for instance, a thought might occur like, why would these Googlers listen to this chick from Australia? That could be a thought that occurs in category three. Why would they listen to me? There are so many more people who have so much more value to offer. So I'm going to ask you to lean into discomfort now. I want you to turn to the person next to you and have a confession session. I want you to share which of those three camps you fall into or if you are all across all three and that's fine too. Okay, so confession session, just half a minute starts now. Those of you watching on live stream, you might want to jot this down. What was it like to have that conversation with a colleague? Very nice. Some of you are literally going, oh, 
anyone feel relieved? Like, oh my gosh, it's not just me. Yeah. And you, I really admire you, and yet you have these thoughts about yourself too. That, that's why I ask you to do this, because everyone is in the same boat. And in fact, I have coached some global CEOs, some people who have appeared on the cover of magazines, and you would never think they would think these thoughts. And yet, in coaching sessions, I swear to you, the most common thing I hear, they'll sit down, pull up a chair, look around, and say, what if they work out that I'm a total fraud? I have no idea what I'm doing. I got here on pure luck. One day they're going to work it out uh, and I'm going to be out of here in a couple of minutes. Anyone have those similar thoughts? Yes, good. Own it. Excellent. All right, so what does this have to do with women in leadership? I actually get this question a lot, which is, do men just not have a lizard brain? And the answer is, of course, men have a lizard brain. And so these thoughts occur whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. But there are a couple of little differences in the male amygdala versus the female amygdala. And I want to be super clear here. I am not into biological determinism. I think gender determin determinism went out with happy pants in the 1990s. It's not about saying, OK, your brain works this way, therefore this is how you act. It's just saying that there are a couple of interesting things about the way the amygdala responds to threat that are worth thinking about when it comes to gender. Is, that, can I, is everyone OK with that distinction? OK, great. So the female amygdala does tend to respond differently to threat in a couple of ways. I should say perceived threat. Firstly, it takes longer to move past that perceived threat in terms of the emotional effect it has on us. So a man, generally speaking, I have to generalize here, a man, generally speaking, may get up on stage and have a terrible speaking gig and just go, that's all right, that's fine, I'll do it better next time. Whereas I've seen so many women get up and speak in front of a group and not show their full potential and they almost make the decision, that's it, I'm not doing that ever again because the, the emotional impact of it has been so hard and it's harder to move past. The other thing that's really worth noting is that women have a higher emotional awareness of others' responses to them during a perceived threat. So basically, we care more about what others think of us when we're putting ourselves out there. Does that make sense to everyone? We have more awareness of what others are thinking of us. And this, to me, explains why the, the well-known study, I'm sure you know it, men will uh, see a job description with and they'll say, oh, I've got six out of 10 criteria, I've got this. Uh, again, I'm generalizing. Uh, and women will say, no, 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 I need the nine or 10 out of 10 to actually apply. Some people put that down to a lack of confidence or a lack of readiness. It's not that. In my opinion, it's simply a thought of, what will others think of me if I go for this role and I've only got six out of 10 of the criteria? Will others think my, I've got uh, too big for my boots, for instance? So. We need to be aware of this, and that's what this has to do with women and leadership. And I'll talk more about that when I get to tips for leaders in terms of creating successful and uh, effective females. OK, so I have three tips for you. First one relates to the lizard voice. These tips are around building confidence, success, energy in the workforce. Tip number one, quieten the lizard. We need to quieten that lizard. Feel free to take notes if this is useful. Uh, and we can do this in two ways. I'm going to share two very practical techniques with you today. Technique number one is called the diffusion technique. Not diffusion, defusion. What happens is most of us fuse with our lizard voice. We think our lizard voice has this, is this font of wisdom and we listen to it. What we need to do is learn to actually defuse from it. So a technique for you. I would like you to think of one of the negative thoughts that occurs to you most often, whether it's I'm not smart enough, I'm not deserving of a relationship, I'm not thin enough, my thighs are too fat, whatever it happens to be. And I want you now to just marinate in that thought. So think about that thought over and over and over again. Okay, go. Okay, sufficiently sad now? <laughs> right, let's break you out of that. So now we're going to slightly shift that thought. Instead of thinking, 
I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. I want you to add just a little bit of a sentence in front of that. So instead of thinking, I'm not good enough, I want you to think, my mind is having the thought that I'm not good enough. So can everyone do that? My mind is having the thought that, and then your lizard thought. Off you go. Notice any difference? What's the difference? Way less emotional. Way less emotional, absolutely. Do you feel a bit more distant from the thought? So you're not fused with it? So that's one diffusion technique, which is my mind is having the thought that. Second technique requires you to lean into discomfort again, because I'm going to ask you to be a little bit silly. Second technique involves using a silly voice. My uh, colleague Sophie does this way better than I do. Uh, she tries to impersonate Arnold Schwarzenegger. So she will say to herself, oh Sophie, you're not smart enough. So what I'm going to get you to do is stand up, exercise those quadriceps, excellent, and this only works if you commit to it, and I know right now your lizard voice is going, oh my god, I'm going to look like an idiot, I can't believe I'm doing this, that's just your lizard voice, it doesn't know what it's talking about, everyone's feeling the same. So on the count of three, we are going to go, I'm not da da da, or I'm not deserving of whatever your lizard voice is. We're going to do it loud and in Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice. Okay, ready? One, two, three. I'm not good enough. Not bad. Sit down. And that's the other thing. Laughing at your lizard, writing it down and seeing what it says tends to make you go, actually, why would I think that? So that's another way of diffusing from the lizard. So that's tip number one today. Quieten the lizard using diffusion techniques. Tip number two, do something scary every single day. Every single day, lean into discomfort and do something scary. I have this great belief that confidence is like a furnace. Once you get a fire going, it's easy to keep it going, correct? You just keep adding fuel onto the fire. And it's the same with confidence. You keep doing something scary every day and you're exercising that confidence muscle. But there is a caveat here. It has to be the right kind of scary. What's the right kind? I've got an analogy that comes from Martha Beck that I love. So I want you to imagine that you are stepping up onto a ladder and walking out onto a diving platform and you are looking down, 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 down and you're about to dive into a pool of toxic sludge. What's the feeling in your body? What's that, sorry? Don't do it. Don't do it, yeah, absolutely. It, does, does any of you, do any of you get a ugh, like a physical revulsion, ugh, get me away from that? Okay, that's the wrong kind of scary. Any kind of scary that makes you feel ugh, you run. You run from whatever that is. Same analogy, so this time walking up, 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 onto the diving platform, about to dive down. This time you're looking into a pool of sparkling, clear blue water. Well, how does your body feel now? Sorry, what's that? Challenged. Challenged. Any other words? Does it, do you get that sort of sense of exhilaration? So fear, yes, but like a... Whew, I've never done this. I will one day to know what it feels like, but I can imagine it's like standing naked in a stiff breeze. Ooh. Anything that makes you feel that kind of scared, that's the scare you go for. You live your life following that kind of fear and you will achieve huge things. You'll build huge amounts of confidence. You'll be hugely successful, hugely effective. All right, so tip number two, do something scary every single day. Tip number three is to samba with your fear. So I'm sure many of you have seen Amy Cuddy's talk on power poses. Hands up who's seen Amy Cuddy's talk, power poses. Okay, I'll, again, I'll briefly explain for those that haven't. Cuddy did some fabulous research where she uh, had two control groups, both going into performance situations like an interview, like a speaking gig, etc. And one group, she just let them prepare in their normal way. The second group, she asked them to do power poses for two minutes. What does she mean by a power pose? This is a power pose. 
this is a power pose, this is a power pose, making your body big. And just by doing that, these people who did these power poses for two minutes performed significantly better in their eyes and in the eyes of others. They got the interview, they nailed the speaking gig, and that happened because they had all these fabulous hormones pumping through their body, like or decrease in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, an increase in testosterone, which funnily enough is the confidence hormone, and serotonin, which is the happy hormone. So by doing this, you actually pump these fabulous hormones into your body. Um, while I talk about the next bit, can everyone just adopt some kind of power pose, all right? It's interesting because so many women I know, I ask them, oh, I'm just going to give you a challenge. Just do this at a meeting. I say, oh, Jeb, I could never do that. <laughs> I would look like an arrogant mm -mm. Uh, And funny enough, you only look like an arrogant mm -mm when you're doing this. Uh, in fact, you don't. The people that do this tend to be arrogant mm -mm. But what happens is that women have been taught to be small, correct? So to stay small, to cross our legs, to do this, that gets in the way of great performance. So that's part of this tip, which is to stumble with the fear, to make sure that before you have a performance situation, you're doing this in some way. But I want you to link it to another tip, which is to pick a song. Just for a minute, I want you to think about going and doing something incredibly scary. I don't know what that would be for you, but speaking in front of a huge group of people, uh, consulting with an executive team, I'm not sure what would strike up that fear for you. But tell me, when you're scared, what's going on for you in your body? What are the, what are the physical sensations? Yes, so hands are clammy, you're shaking, cold, thirsty, absolutely. Heart pumps, you have to pee, yes. <laughs> Anyone get the butterflies in the stomach? Yeah. Okay. Now, think about, is there another emotion where I feel those same physical symptoms? Excitement. Yeah. For me, though, I got used to get those same physical symptoms back in my early 20s when it was a Saturday night and I was getting ready to go out and I was thinking, I might meet the man of my dreams tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's almost like a flirty kind of sensation, if that makes sense, and if I may reveal that to this wonderful audience. Um, if Once you've got that replacement feeling, so a feeling that is a positive feeling that you feel those, uh, those physical symptoms for, I then want you to pick a song that you link to that new feeling. So a song that when you put it on, you immediately feel excited, flirty, whatever that feeling is for you. So for me, there's this fabulous a cappella group called The Idea of North, and they do this version of Mashke Nada, and it's like, Mashke Nada, da 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 and that just, it brings up this feeling of flirtiness straight away. Uh, what I'm promising you is that if you play that song, Every time before a situation that scares you, so in, for instance, if you have a fear of speaking, public speaking, if you, play, if you go and play that song and you're doing power poses, this is where the toilet cubicle is your best friend, so music on power poses for two minutes, you will learn over time to associate that scary activity with the new, more positive feeling. If you do it often enough, it will absolutely happen to the point where when I go to speak in front of groups now, I do feel a little flirty. So it does happen. So that's my third tip. Samba with a fear. Toilet cubicle, power poses, and music that generates that new feeling. Yes? <laughs> that is a... <laughs> Absolutely. Or if you're, at, if you're at, a, at a board meeting and you're in two hours, like kind of doing this might be seen as a little, yes. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't do that in public, I would go, the, I would, so I, I said to Ian, I'm just going to the bathroom. I was doing this in the cubicles. No one would know. Uh, so do that as, as close to the, uh, whatever the scary situation, uh, scary situation is as you can. But the key thing then is when you're in a situation where you can't do this, sit in a power pose. So don't sit like this, sit with like this, sit like that, put your arm over a chair, anything that you can do. And if the conversation's boring, play the song in your head. 
and just do a little mini dance internally. <laughs> Great question. All right, I actually will pause for questions now before I move on to tips for leaders. So let's just go through those tips again to become confident, successful, increase our effectiveness. Remember tip number one? Diffuse the lizard, quiet the lizard. Excellent. Tip number two? Do something scary every day, but it has to be the right kind of scary. Good. And tip number three? Yes. Somewhere with a fear while doing power poses. <laughs> Excellent. Any questions on those three tips before I move into talking about leaders? The thing, so the question was, can I give you an example of the things I do every day? that help me feel confident, is that is that it? Yes, it's, it's scary. Oh, the scary, uh, scary things I do every day. Talking at Google <laughs> is my scary thing for the day. Um, so uh, I, uh, even now, uh, promoting my business, making sales calls, it's not something, I'm, I'm an introvert, it's not something that comes naturally, so I push myself to do that. Uh, applying for awards, um, uh, Inkling just got, or, few months ago got selected by KPMG uh, to form part of a, a group of uh, 10 outstanding Australian businesses to help get launched into the US and putting together that application was really scary. So for me, every everything scary that I like to focus on is about moving me to the next level in terms of how much service I can be to others. So yes, that's a good question. Thank you. And I have to say what feels scary and the right kind of scary to you will be completely different to what might feel the right kind of scary to me. Um, and to me, that is, if you follow that, that's like the path of how you're going to look back on your life and say, oh my goodness, I loved that. It's not just look what I achieved, but I loved it. And I'm so proud of myself. Any other questions before? And there'll be time for questions at the end if you're kind of still thinking and processing. No? Okay. All right. Let's move on to some tips for leaders to make sure that you're encouraging women to thrive in your team. So if you're a people leader, this will be uh, hopefully useful. It's also for aspiring people leaders out there. Tip number one actually goes back to being aware of the lizard. So don't dismiss, don't dismiss someone not a woman not putting their hand up for promotion, speaking opportunity, stretch opportunity. Don't dismiss that as lack of confidence or lack of readiness. Instead, make sure you are tapping women on the shoulder and saying, what about that? I think you would be great for that. But my caveat here is you have to be tapping them on the shoulder to move in a direction that is exciting to them, that aligns with their values and their aspirations. I've worked with so many women who do get the tap on the shoulder, which is great, but there is this sense of, oh, okay, great, I'll go there, and I'll, I'll go there. Perhaps because there's a, more of a, this emotional, heightened emotional awareness of how others respond to us, there can be a bit of a people-pleasing um, situation, and again, I'm generalizing, but I've coached so many women who have been tapped on the shoulder, tapped on the shoulder, tapped on the shoulder, and gone, okay, yeah, great, thank you, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, and they've reached the top of their ladder, and they look back and go, oh, I'm on the wrong ladder. I don't love what I do. I, I've climbed this summit. I really want to be on that ladder, but I am so terrified of losing my salary, <laughs> losing my identity, identity and starting again. So make sure, and this goes for men and women, the, the people you lead, you must understand their values and where they want to go and what feels juicy to them and give them stretch opportunities that help them meet those aspirations. For women in particular, it's incredibly important. So tip number one, be aware of the lizard. Uh, tip number two, create space. This is in a few ways. I've, I've talked to a few people around the, the conversational style at Google. I don't think this is a necessarily a problem here, but it may be in other organizations you go on to work for. The dominant conversational style in many organizations tends to be quite masculine and competitive. It doesn't mean that women can't do it spectacularly well. I'm not talking men and women, I'm talking masculine versus feminine. Um, and certainly when I was in management consulting, I got so good at this, I, I call it the tennis match style, 
where it's like, bam, I'm really smart. No, bam, I'm smarter than you. But bam, here's my point. And no one's actually listening to each other. It's sort of like, look at me, look what I can do, and look, look how I can think. And I got so good at this style that uh, one, one Christmas I went home, uh, and my mum said to me, oh, darling, you're getting a bit bossy. So we can get really good at this, but this style tends, as I said, it's a masculine style. It tends to favour the loudest and most competitive voices. And I've worked with a lot of tech companies where women in particular, not always, but women in particular feel like they cannot get heard and their voices aren't listened to. So my suggestion for leaders is to name the conversational style you've got in your team. Once you give it a name, encourage people to call out. If you feel like it's not an inclusive conversational style, encourage people to call that style out. Oh, let's, it's not a tennis match. Let's just get on to Or it's not a tennis match. Let's hear what Captain has to say, etc. Another way we need to create space is that, did you know women, uh, on average, get interrupted three more times than men? Three to one. And I was telling this to, I was sitting in a cafe at Palo Alto. Anyone been to Valencia? Um, good coffee. Anyway, I was sitting at this cafe and this very loud VC kind of guy started asking me what I did. And I started telling him and <laughs> he said, well, you, I was talking. He said, well, I've got my opinions on women and leadership. Oh, you're kind of proving my point. So make sure, uh, make sure that you are not interrupting women and that you're not, you're not, insisting that women are the ones that say, excuse me, can I finish what I have to say? Call the interruptions in your team uh, in a really non-aggressive way. Oh, I think Catherine had something to say there. Right, third way to create space. Make sure there's a space for women-only programs, women-only initiatives. And I know this is really controversial, and the number of organisations I've worked with that say, oh, we can't do that, it's politically incorrect, we need to bring the men along. Of course, we need, of co and I'm so glad there are men here today. Of course, it's gender diversity benefits men and women. Absolutely, of course. The results in terms of results, uh, in terms of meeting potential and lifting performance, when you get women in a leadership program together, three to one. Results are improved three to one versus a gender mixed leadership program. So that's another way to create space for women. Okay, so tip number one, make sure you're aware of the lizard. Tip number two, create space. Excellent. Tip number three, ah, this is an important one. Get it. Get gender diversity. Make it your mission to understand, not just intellectually. So I, I, I need leaders to understand not just, yes, I know that when you reach gender parity, executive level or at leadership level, everything changes in an organisation. I know that 15% of executives in America are women. I know that, I don't know if you know this, you've got a better chance of being named CEO of a Fortune 500 company here if your name is John than if you're a woman. So I know this. I, I, it's really important as leaders for you to get it here, to get it emotionally. And one of the things we do when we're working with executive teams is with permission from the people on the team, we put pictures of their daughters up on a slideshow. And we say, because your daughter was born a girl, she is this percent less likely to become a CEO. She's this percent less likely, she's this percent more likely to have violence done to her. Once you make it personal, once you think of a, a girl or a woman you love and what the research means for her and her life, that's when leaders get gender diversity. Right, I'm going to open up for questions in a minute, but I do have some homework for you. Homework is commit to applying one of these tips, one of the three tips I gave you to increase your success. If you are a people leader, you've got two tips to commit to. Okay, so one of the first set and one of the third set. And I would love you to email me at gemma at inklingwomen.com to tell me what you committed to. And I, if, if you don't get a chance to ask a question today or is it, there's a question that you feel is a little personal, feel free to email me at that address too. And then the second bit of homework, I would love you to share one of the tips with others. We believe at Inkling Women in creating a ripple effect in terms of gender diversity. So share a tip that you might have found useful with someone today. I'd love to open it up for questions. Does anyone, does anyone have questions from the audience? Oh, 
question is about the three to one. Did you say two things about the three to one ratio? One is the get three times interrupt yes. more often, and another is that you include women in a congregation or gathering. So my decision making, you will have some result. The second one, I don't fully second understand. Second one, you don't fully understand. So, in terms of results uh, in individual performance, in going in a leadership program, a mixed leadership program versus a women only leadership program, you get three to one results with a women's leadership program for women. Obviously, don't put men in a women's leadership program because that would perhaps be a little bit weird for them. But the women who go on a women's only leadership program achieve three to one results in terms of getting promoted, in terms of performance ratings from their peers and their executives. That makes sense? So women's only programs for women are more effective than mixed programs. We've got a white paper on it. If anyone wants me to share it, I'm, I'm happy to just email me. Other questions? Do you have tips for how to handle being interrupted? Yes, I do. I got asked this question so much, I actually made a video on it, how to insert yourself into the conversation. But I'll share a couple of them with you today. And I, I'm, if you want to email me, I'm happy to forward you that video. Um, one is the broken record technique. So you just keep saying the same thing. So what I think on this is, so what I think on this is, so what I think on this is, you feel like an idiot, but it eventually works. Um, another thing is to actually call it, but you, when you call the interruption, you need to make sure there's no emotion uh, involved. So, so what I think is, Kevin, can you let me finish what I'm saying? It's always, I always call guys Kevin, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, hey, Kevin, can you let me finish what I'm saying? And actually call it there in a really calm way. And the third thing is, if you've tried one and two, uh, and neither of them work, let them have their rant, because often it's a rant, <laughs> and then at the end, summarize what they've said. So Kevin, what I've heard is, bah, 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 here's my view. And you, if you do that, you actually tend to sound like the smartest person in the room. Yeah, I'll just wait for the mic if that's all right. So any tip on, so what if your manager want you to sit on the back seat instead of a leader? And what if he what seat, sorry? back seat back back seat gotcha back seat. sorry yeah and what if he want you to the same uh, solution of problem he did rather listening to a man than listening to you so you have to go through a second channel in order to convey the message yes uh, that's really difficult um, before I give you a tip I I've, I've noticed there is almost and I'm not I don't know your situation of course at all but I have noticed there's almost this discrimination that in some ways is reverse discrimination. I, I see uh, some men have kind of a, a uh, caring, patronizing sense of, oh, that would be too hard for you. Like, I don't want to put you in the deep end. And they do this for women. Where, and they, they, I honestly had this uh, male exec come and talk to these women that we were running a program with. And he talked about his story and how he was crying at nights and he was vomiting because it was horrible. But he's so glad he went through that because now he's here. And then he left the room, and these women said to me, "They don't do that to me. They won't. They, he, he won't give me those opportunities because he's looking after me, and he wants me to be protected. So we've got to watch that. In terms of actually managing that, it, I'm, I'm hesitant to give you a tip because it really depends on the personality of the guy involved. Um, but I would imagine. Have, have you had a conversation with him about it? Yeah. Observe and learn. Observe and learn. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm wondering if, again, it depends on the person. I don't want to give you uh, uh, advice that could get you fired. So, you know, <laughs> that caveat in place. I found what works the best is actually calling that and saying, here's my perception. Uh, please tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, my sense is you don't want me to move into a leadership position and you're quite happy for me to stay here. I do want to move into a leadership position, so can we have that conversation? And again, it's not, there's no, no aggression there, there's no emotion, it's just stating it as it is in a really factual way. I've done that before uh, to guys. I've called guys out for, for sexist behaviour, and that tends to be, that they actually tend to go, oh, I have no idea. So that would be my suggestion. No worries. Other questions? We will come to you. <laughs> uh, 
sometimes I uh, get comments from people that I don't really know what to make of. So, and they're like nice people, but they'll say uh, that uh, women in general might have an easier time, let's say, finding a job in tech because there's been all this attention uh, to equality and there's just a lack of women applicants. And then they'll make it sound like, oh yeah, you got your job because you're a girl, like a little bit, not like too much, but a little bit. Uh, what, what, how, how can I, you know, deal with that? Yeah, it, that is such a good question. And again, it depends on the kind of person you are and how much you feel like you could get away with in the situation. But I've been known to say to people who've insinuated that, to say, have you ever thought that maybe you're here because you're a guy? So maybe you're in the position you're at. We've had, we've had generations where male leaders have been advantaged. Have you, have you ever thought that you are here simply because of your gender? And that tends to shut them up pretty quickly. Um, but it, if that does require a little bit of, uh, there's a good word for that, but I'm sure it's rude, so I'm not going to use it. It does require some courage. Um, if not, I actually think just, just calling that and actually asking the question again, a completely non-emotional way, are you saying that I'm here just because I'm a woman? I'm not smart enough to be here? and you watch them retreat back from that position really, really quickly. Hi, um, I had a question about making space. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that in meetings, um, especially in, in business, there can be a culture um, within the meeting or a tone that's combative or masculine and loud. Yes. Um, I'm wondering what the characteristics are of a feminine tone in meetings and also if there are any leaders or forums that you could point me to because when I'm thinking of examples I think whether it's politics or sports or television shows it's everywhere it's yes. loud and it's in your face and it's combative and so what what are examples of the other side absolutely what a, I, I love that question I actually uh, when I was working in this consultancy that did have this masculine tennis match style and I was really I was I was really feeling I was feeling the pressure to be other than who I was at the same time, I started working with this male project director who had quite a feminine style of conversation. And that the, it actually felt like ideas were allowed to blossom rather than shut down, shut down. So stupid ideas were allowed to percolate. Um, ideas that were raised were given, uh, 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 what's the word, were actually acknowledged. They were given acknowledgement. Um, and there, there is a sense, a more feminine style, there is a sense of yes, and rather no but yes and in terms of examples can you leave that with me and can I get your details afterwards because I actually want that's a really good question and I don't have anyone springing to mind sadly so I'd love to email you some examples once I've given it some thought um, let's do a question from the door really fast so um, when you think about some of the best leaders you've observed slash worked with what are some of the characteristics or behaviors they have that make them great yeah uh, I, there's actually uh, some research done by Gallup and the research was done on 10,000 followers and looking at what these followers needed from their leaders and I, I know this research and I also know the leaders I've worked with that I have responded best to and they do align. So the, the Gallup research says that followers require leaders to uh, provide stability. So I don't know if you've ever uh, had a leader where you never quite know what you're going to get on a certain day and some days like is it going to be eggshells today and you're kind of tentatively walking into the office providing a sense of stability is important creating hope creating this sense of here's what the future looks like and it's going to be incredible and here's how we're going to get there together showing compassion is another one that's really important and building trust if you as a leader can do those four things then followers respond and I've certainly had leaders that have been able to do that You hear me? Um, a common criticism of lean-in advice is that it places the burden on women to deal with the consequences of a system not of their own making. How can organizations help to redire redirect that burden to be even more evenly shared? I just want to say whoever asked that, I love that question because it's so true. We were pitching for this um, <clears throat> program with 10 high potential women in a car sales organization and uh, that the top, where the top 50 leaders were male, no female in the top 50 level leaders. And one of their aims for this program was uh, at the end of the program, women will be able to champion gender equity and change the culture in the organization. You are putting that burden on 10 
women in the organisation. So for me, it's incredibly important that, yes, we, we need to make sure that women have the confidence and skills to navigate an environment that is less than ideal for some women. At the same time, though, you cannot do that without working with the organisation's leaders to help them get it and to, to give them the skills to help these women who are actually being developed to thrive. So to me, it always has to be that joint approach. And what you're looking for in the end is you're wanting women to climb up through um, the leadership path to become leaders in the organisation and eventually to have enough critical mass there to shape how work gets done in that organisation. Hey, you were mentioning the gentleman at the cafe who had an opinion about what you do. So I'm just wondering what he had to say or just generally what, what do the skeptics oh, say? Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> His view was, well, you just, uh, sorry, I have this male voice. I know you male men don't all talk like this, but he was quite blustery. Well, you know, I get women and I, I, I'm able to tell the men in my organisation what they're doing wrong and I say that to women and they say, you're just saying that because I'm a woman and they've just got a big chip on their shoulder and at that point <clears throat> I start to switch off a bit but I actually did fight back. You tend to get a number of, it's a really good question, you tend to get a number of common reactions from people. One is, I think the issue is overstated. Uh, one is, uh, women don't need fixing. And I actually, I, I do have a video that I made on the how to respond to the common reactions, the common negative reactions to gender diversity. Um, so if anyone wants that, just, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to share. I think I went through six common reactions, and here's what you can say. So usually the behavior is the mirror behavior, right? So if you're working with uh, a lot of men and not women, you tend to become, uh, you know, you, to survive, you want to become like them a little bit to be able to, to work with them. But maybe you don't like that. You know, maybe end of the day you don't want to be like that. Yes. And so that's a very conflicting kind of feeling. You do it right, maybe it works, but end of the day do you, want, you don't want to be like that. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's it's actually natural. We uh, uh, Albert Bandura has this social learning theory. We learn by imitating others and by mimicking others. And if the, the dominant leadership style has been masculine, competitive, hierarchical, etc., that's what we tend to learn. We need to do to be successful. It's a survival thing. We imitate so that we can survive in a certain situation. Um, at the same time, though, there can be a sense of inauthenticity and feeling like I'm not being exactly who I am, and that feels icky too. So you, are, you have hit the nail on the head. You are absolutely right. One thing I suggest to people who find themselves in this situation, and it's men and women too, by the way. I was working with an all-male executive team, and uh, the CEO said to me, well, I was about to say his name. Uh, let's say he's called Kevin, because as I, you know, as you know, I call all men Kevin. Well, Kevin, you know, he's, he's great. He's, he's performing well, but he can't fit in. He's a vegetarian. He doesn't eat sausages. He doesn't drink. I'm like, oh my god, how inclusive are you not being at the moment? Um, what I suggest to men and women who feel like they're in this situation where they cannot be themselves is to start making little tweaks. So not suddenly coming into work as yourself, because that's going to feel way too scary, and your colleagues will go sort of whiplash, who are you, I don't really trust you anymore, but making little tweaks, just planning a little tweak you can make to be more yourself at work, some of them you actually find, actually this is great, people respond to me better. So just build that up, eventually if you feel like you're trying to be yourself and it doesn't work in this environment, that's when you need to start thinking, well, is this the right environment for me, do I need to find an environment where I feel like I can be truly who I am? Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay, we can go from the dory. So, bravado versus bravery. A lot of leaders have this fake it till you make it, bluster and pretense way of leading, but not may not always have your back when it counts. What are the attributes of a truly brave change maker? Oh, what a great question. Um, <clears throat> I ironically think the attributes of someone who's brave and who's changing the way things get done one of the attributes is absolutely vulnerability. So bravado for me is, look how great I am, look what I can do. Uh, there is that sense of bluster about it. Having said that, I do think sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. But if you, if you are doing that, and at the same time you're not being honest and open with others about where you're struggling, uh, being honest and open uh, with others and, and being vulnerable and actually having that sense of, here's who I am, you don't tend to get to, you don't 
tend to be respected by those who follow you. We actually follow people who show us who they are and that requires opening themselves up and, and telling people what they are afraid of and giving people a sense of this is where we're at, these are the problems, I am really nervous and yet I see this fabulous goal for the future and here's how we're going to work together. I think the other attribute, so um, bravado tends to be me, me, me. Brave tends to be let's bring people along. So it's not about me, it is about this team and creating results as a team. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you.